reflections that he wore the Godhead and did not worship, he should have been the first to know, deriving his self from joy and even suffering that was not his, enthralled by whatever gift came and he had seemed never exhausted by his deserving or not deserving bounty of the givers. He should have straightened his ways and not taken so easily what the demonic suggestion gave so easily, gave away to him, but head in the honey. He would be taken in by whatever sweetness moved him, or deep sounding thing or flaming that came on him in reading the green of a tree, the promise taken in a star, or the wisdom texts of Plutarch, Boeing, or second hand, third hand, whatever hand, Orpheus out of a professor's study, for instance. And before he composed the Theogony, but this composing was a receiving, a recognizing, a seeing that it fit, having in that what authenticity? Hadn't he heard in the great passages of Charles Olson's Maximus resounding theogony? That life shakes like a drum and would discover resonances of what it loves in its own beat, the old man wedding and heeding the head of the drum until it answered the tone he sought that sought him. And then they will dance the waltz of the dead, and then the waltz of flowers, and the waltz of the saints who have entered the waltz they play. Note, it is built up of passages of music we heard in Majorca, where the church forbade dancing. They would dance even in its being forbidden. But in the 13th century, before the righteous hearts hardened against the ease of Christendom, they danced la quinte estante real in the cathedral, Christ the leader of the waltz, but he was himself, he said, the waltz itself. Charles Olson, how strangely I have altered and used and would keep the wisdom, the man, the self I choose after your warnings against wisdom as such, as if it were, quote, solely the issue of the time, of the moment, of its creation, and not any ultimate except what the author in his heat in that instant, in its solidity, yield. The old man tunes his drum between the bowl of fire and the bowl of water, listening to the music that is about to come. We cannot retrace our steps. Going forward may be the same as going backwards. We cannot retrace our steps. Retrace our steps. All my long life, all my life, we do not retrace our steps. All my long life, but a silence, a long silence. But we do not retrace our steps. All my long life in here, here we are, here. In marble and gold, did I say gold? Yes, I said gold. In marble and gold and where? A silence. Where is where? In my long life of effort and strife, dear life, life is strife in my long life. It will not come and go, I tell you so. It will stay, it will pay, but a long silence. But why want what we, we've got? Has it not gone? What made it live? Has it not gone? Because now it is head. In my long life, in my long life, silence. Life is strife. I was a martyr all my life, not to what I won, but to what was done. Silence. Do you know because I tell you so? Or do you know? Do you know? Silence. My long life. My long life. Supplication. O oh, poetry, visit this house often. Imbue my life with success. Leave me not alone. Give me a wife and 
home. Take this curse off of early death and drugs. Make me a friend among peers. Lend me love and timeliness. Return me to the men who teach. And above all, cure the hurts of wanting the impossible through this suspended vacuum. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. So I wanted, especially the John Wiener's poem, uh, to set us on the path, as I see, that I want to do in this room. And I wanted to start with these two gentlemen tonight because uh, I, Joe and I went through a, a wonderful episode now. With, it's, what, 20 years later, where um, this kid, you know, called out Boston saying we had no masters and we needed a good master in Boston. And uh, we explained to him that we didn't want the kinds of masters that he was talking about, that we had people amongst us that were with us, that were our friends, that were our companions in trying to make poetry. And uh, they were quite masterful in what they were doing and in their example. And there was never a sense of mass being mastered by those people, and uh, the two premier people in my heart uh, are Garrett Lansing and William Corbett, who are here with us tonight, and I thank both of them for coming. Um, I had begged, borrowed, pleaded, and they just said, of course, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do all that work. Uh, we'll start with Garrett. Garrett, uh, is, uh, I was sitting, uh, let me back up one second, because uh, I should also introduce two other people. Katha Seidman, whose paintings are on the wall, couldn't be here tonight because it's a holiday. And she didn't realize that when she committed to doing this. Katha was the original art director. I love titles, you know, it sounds so important. We used to get, in word of mouth, I got letters from people saying, you know, your group, you know, your society, you know, your, your organizers need to X, Y, and Z. And uh, it was just three of us. It was uh, my roommate, Andrea Stover, uh, who I got a lovely message from this morning. And uh, Katha Seidman, and uh, we sat down and, and figured out that we were, we were going to, we were going to change poetry was the original idea, right? Uh, and we soon learned a whole lot of other things that, that were more important than changing poetry, I think. And then the other person I want to recognize that is sitting down the front is this devil here, Roman Martinuk. Uh, Roman did all of the poster work for the first <laughs> series, and, um, <laughs> measuring everything here against you know what you set us on because what Roman enabled us to do originally was to look serious like it, we had these beautiful posters I, I set a bunch of them out I went into the bags that they're all living in and pulled them out and you can see some that he did some that I did uh, the original one is here and then the glossy ones are definitely Roman um, but um, uh, and a lot of them I the original ones I cannibalized and did my own paste up on after uh, Roman got you know like had a life and was a daughter and a wife and was doing things, but uh, I, for the hundred thousand time, but still, I mean, thank you, Roman, because it wouldn't have been the same without those other two people there. And then I wanted Joe to read tonight as well, because Joe was the, the breath of fresh air that came in to me uh, uh, off of the, um, the Robert Duncan Memorial, actually, right? That's where we met. Uh, that, and when his, his presence there put the, the room in a whole other place than it had previously been. And, and made it wonderful. Well, you know, and, and, uh, it worked, whatever it was, it was wonderful. But that brings me back around. I, I was saying earlier in the evening, and, and Kath and I were sitting out here laughing as we put up the art the other day, because the, the whole first year sucked outside of Bill, um, because it was uh, the majority of the people that came, came in and read and then left, and we never saw them again. And I finally remember sort of obnoxiously saying to somebody, you know, well, why do you want to read it? Have you been down? And they said, oh, no, oh, you know, but I'm very busy. And I said, why do you want to come read if you don't care about the people that are sitting in front of you when you do? So I was sort of in that mood. And that fall, this would have been the fall now of, of uh, 87, right? And um, the fall of 87, uh, Bill, um, at that point, uh, had 
had sent Clayton Eshelman to me, and he read for me, uh, he did a talk. <laughs> I forgave you. <laughs> it was actually wonderful. And uh, he did a great talk, and then did a, a magnificent reading uh, at Blacksmith House the next night. And man, it felt like stuff was happening. And we all went out, Bill invited me out afterwards, and uh, we were sitting there, and I was talking to a man sitting to my left, and um, you know, we were kind of trading stuff back and forth, and Robert Duncan came up, and the next thing we were having this magnificent conversation about Robert Duncan, and I finally said, who the hell are you? Well, I'm, I'm Michael Franco, and he said, well, my name's Garrett Lansing. And I've been reading Garrett's work in uh, the Marvelous Magazine Credences, which is still, for me, the high watermark. Um, and uh, yeah, that set Garrett and I off, and uh, Garrett was welcoming, brought us up for lunch. Uh, we had lunch with you and Garrett. Uh, up in Gloucester, out of the old, at the old house, and then that following, uh, that everything sort of died over Christmas, of course, and the following February, uh, just about the time we were getting ready to start back up, Robert Duncan died, and I immediately phoned Garrett and said, we have to do something, and I went up there, and Garrett sat at the table, and he said, whatever you do, do something, do something, and so we set up on short notice, obviously, uh, a reading that occurred. Robert died on the 3rd of February. We are up by the 6th of March. And at that reading, uh, I met there everybody, Mr. Torah included, that uh, I needed to know. And from that point on, the, the series carried itself. Um, I'll come back to Bill's contribution to that in a little bit. But what Garrett did was, uh, I mean, here was this poet that I you know, knew, legendary, all that stuff that I deeply respected, that I was looking curiously at his work. And, um, and, and, and as with some of the other poets that we all know, you get this lordly sense that you're you know, lucky to be in their presence, let alone talk to them. And Garrett was not that way. Uh, Garrett was warm and inviting. Um, anything that I brought up to Garrett, uh, I mean, it was like this beautiful place would open up and Garrett would go, oh, yeah. And start talking, and if I and I learned quickly, as I had with Mr. Duncan, to shut the hell up and listen. <laughs> and it, it, but it was never a lesson. It was always this joyous depth of knowledge and learning that you can and will, in a moment, hear in his poetry. As far as I'm concerned, one of the wonderful poetries that we have amongst us, one of the guiding lights, the great librarian, grammarian of Gloucester, Massachusetts. Please welcome. You get to choose your, your instrument. You can sit, you can sit. I think I'll sit. Well, Michael and Isabel, thank you. It's great to be here. I remember this room. Every year it was that you can hear politics. And of course, I remember before walking with you in Ravenswood and Lincoln Crane. Ah, far. Yes. 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 But this room is wonderful, and uh, one can't retrace steps, as you said, but you can make a new path, and I'm going to do that. Yeah. I can't get over the look of this room now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, see. I, I helped out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of your mind? Is <laughs> <laughs> Was it really in 1988 that word of mouth got off the ground? No, 87. 87, yeah. yeah. Wow. And then we met in the fall of 87. Yeah. And then the Duncan Memorial was winter of 88. Well, I'm deliberately not going to read some poems that I read very recently in Cambridge at the uh, library. Some of them so I'm going to read a slightly different selection. This is a poem that I wrote way back in New York City. And I was seeing a lot of John Ashbury and Frank O'Hara and others. But it's not that it's like them. Uh, the Castle of Flowering Birds. Fancy in the mind, the graceful flaunters of the summer air arise like flowers from their seeds. Bodies bronze and fledged in blue, uniforms that music wears when most she is herself. Not sound only, but fugitive and sly. The fox occult among the grapes, 
anonymous in Summer's horn. Brilliant beyond a self, the birds are dumb with feeling, an afternoon of wings. The company of love, safe in the garden that is themselves, more ghost than garden, more brute than bird, acclaim the throbbing animal. The beastly petals green with blood. And this next poem uh, is a version of the Chinese poet Li Shangyin, uh, of which I heard a wonderful version at uh, Harvard when uh, uh, at the poet the Woodbury Poetry Room, uh, what his name was reading. The Blowing. Boulder Behind Blowing. the House. A thin rain from the east, a mist over Mill River, delicate thunder. Here be no gold toad of luck, no tiger of jade, but in the backyard a red-brown rock, grim and saladus immense, shoves out of the earth. Once a great heiress behind a screen hidden loved with her eyes a handsome poor youth. A river goddess rode, rose once from the water to give a great prince her pillow of love. Mere instances. Will your heart gape wide with spring flowers? The candles of love fall into ashes. The rock is auroral. Then this, this next poem, I seem to dedicate every time she's here to Amanda Cook, but I'll do it again. Anna Strong Nights for Amanda. I tell you it was real. Bayberry bushes on the hill, the house, yellow moon and simple love. But oh, fox laughter from the woods, the white fox running through the pines. Need fire. Impure of necessity, I cannot shut it out. The poem of fire that burns in the night, men know not how to use. A way of love, lines of flame, too familiar to be a god. It is the keyboard of desire. These poems are really, a lot of the ones I'm reading are uh, dedicated to Eros in some fashion. This is called Perion. By far the best farmers lovers are, whose bodies glisten in the light they make and throw so carelessly around them in molten afternoons. Husbandry is what it takes to make the world splash in our heads. Exploding water light. So nothing's unhinged, the far-fetched pleasure. By fostering, the greenness comes again. New arising, flower world, sweetness suck of naked verity. Afternoons are molten because melting is consequence of whatever passionate perception. Without fusing them, the flower of mind makes all things capable of extremity, not adjectival, concentering, so that toy lovers like us melt, reform in solar innovation. Our substances now justify anew made accurate by bliss, a balance, a tempering, a style.
Perianth is the word I wrote, meaning the sepals and the petals, to remind me of a floral unity of love, and also how we double on ourselves the world, when our bodies shoot and the heavens open, how we suffice each other in ourselves. One of the company of light. The star man in my heart is young and moves with all the strength memory masters. Shoots as a soldier in the boyhood game was supposed to. That brilliant and keen. He is the might of the doom of the stalwart. The heart of the men defending Maldoom. He is untarnished. He moves in the untold vigil of the children of others, the warrior behind the doler of actual war game stupidity. Lucent he is, nothing lacking. He is eminence fixed in the coldest blue eyes. He is white and renews the ancient floraison. Supple and amorous, he desires Christ and Achilles be one. And in the golden fields he sees them drink from one cup, naked and hot in the heat of the sun. Let's see, I think this is a really an um, elegy in memory of my friend, the wonderful poet David Rattray. Elegiac fantasy delayed in glass. Elegy is distance and thereby memory and whisper of the winter wind that sings between the darkness long mistaken for a light expanding like the water flower and a morning redness mistaken for, sometimes glad, extinction. Brown sugar that melts from grim to wistful. Will you rise to rampant red as peony, good doctor? Thereby, so by thereby, absence enlarges to touch your body simplified all over everywhere in desire under and around ground and variations of some love and is warranted warmest sooth roses from the merry devil and urged by urges new needs to be explored in the service of in not centered center whose will or what directs we do not know, slow, being so, and only so licensed to rovers, these tongues and hands. What explosions, lassitude, explosion, O oh lassitudo. Extolling thus the gratitude and eerie recognition, afterwards the peace that promises the seed of still future glorious storms. A tempered doom lies on the rug like history, barring the flight to remorseless islands bathed in golden light where was offered immortal fruit. The given stuck. Surprise! The fool on the hill claimed I would recognize the foiling fatal speed of time when I reached his speed, but when did I scorned his sagesse because the force between our singularities, yours and mine, was independent of the separating speed. That history, no crystalline delay, tempered what was called our frailty in those far-off days and nights we feared the forest. Though the archons assuage to mystify, swathe us in their money clothes, such purposes only yet assuage false will, false mask, unrealized errant husk, and fate's fell body. And so, by halt or exercise of stop, we preserve the purity of lust, unfailing light that played on puppet limbs, and in alembic danced. Indistinct it is to elegize or laud, it is to swing, foot the ancient round, under crystal mutable. Aha. Not in the book. 
at the games of the gods. This was published as a postcard by Bill. Uh, I was very happy with beautiful stars around it on the postcard. From it. Uh, at the games of the gods. How fast the past rushes by sky dotted with old stars and new stars keep being born in our silly hearts a la luz de las estrellas armase de valor. Read this now. On hampering. What hampers us? Are we hampered at every turn by an artistic tradition of over 2,000 years? But yes, hampering is of the present, but also of the past, when and how you were born, and to whomever. Though hampering implies unhampering, as I walked on dog bar breakwater to the very end, seemingly unhampered that summer day. So maybe we should give up thinking, especially if thinking is worrying about what determines us or how many angels compel us every day. And behold, simply behold, the great white birds flying about us, making their noise. And this is a reading appearance and reality in the mountains. If the tiger in the house is also a fireside sphinx, should we not, not and not not, recognize the mountains we see? Mountains shrouded in mist, climbing them as catch can, scratched by thorns and buffeted so, the mountains covered with cats, empty and figment of figments, so bespeak the great cat mountain we dream. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to close with a poem that I certainly wrote in Doster uh, shortly after living there near Ravenswood. The Curve. How one incurs the burden of a city and Indians. This is where I came in, by the pest house, through the old woods. Not over that flubbery span no sentinel owns. Comes into one's own reality. Making the place by pacing the place. Live or live, change vowel, I, heart. The stature commensurate with the gist of the nation. Imagination against the curve, the way it slants in, the lay of the land, unseen but by Indians. Then, thanks ever be to Charles Olson for Indians, then the alien eyes, mine eyes have seen the, mine eyes alien, Dutch, not Indian, outer planetary, were keener for the curve. How wolves and lions came in. Quote, Some affirm that they have seen a lion at Cape Ann, which is not about six leagues from Boston. So I round another man's measure to round out my own, to speak of Discover Rock, the pristine we work to inherit, native load to shoot out again is not to make up Harry Martin, some queer hemisphere. It is to smell, to dig with a hand, to demonstrate, and at least to reclaim, to come in, like Indians, on this curve, from the ravening wood, to a city we once could be citizens of. Thank you. Thank you. Um.
was cool. I stole it. I stole it from Louisa. Oh. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves for a moment. <laughs> Well, where to begin? With our next reader, um, the luck I had in stumbling into Bill's work and then getting him to come read for me uh, the original series. Uh, I, <laughs> I reject your email. <laughs> it, 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 I was telling you to Isabel, it's a whole different world since word of mouth ended. We now all had our habit. We had no phones. We had no email when word of mouth ended. I don't think we had computers. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, you may not have had a computer. You know, you know. Most of us did. First lifts on a typewriter. Yeah, 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 yeah. God. It's a whole different world, um, but that world that Bill set me out on, uh, not only did he give me a reading and a half, the first reading was there, he gave me an audience and that came and went and came and went and for that first year, as I was saying, um, but there was also uh, the friendship that developed between him. Bill ended up marrying me and Isabel um, in our living room in Arlington, but with the poetry world, what Bill did was Bill gently sent people my way. And uh, I don't know what he said to them. My fantasy is that he said, call Michael Franklin and see. And the few times that I didn't have any interest, uh, there was never any hell to pay afterwards. And I really quickly recognized that because the first time I think I held my breath and said, I hope Bill's not pissed. He wasn't. It was up to me. And the steady trickle that came through gave me access to people that were in Bill's world that I would have never had access to. And again, it put the series into uh, a level of seriousness that I could not have manufactured uh, without him. So it's been, what, 1987? How many years now? A friendship and caring. And uh, we let him go. I don't know why we did this. We should have, you know, marched him to Columbus Square and said, bullshit, you ain't going to New York. We're not going to let you leave. Um, and I know Joe and I talked about what are we going to do. The scene's going to be different. It's never going to be the same. Um, and then there was the wonderful event at Harvard where we all sat around and we talked about the joyous hospitality and uh, the uh, what's the, I don't know the word. Uh, to love. sit in the love. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, to sit at the table at, at Columbus Square was to feel that. You felt like you were actually a poet. You felt like there was love. You felt like there was a possibility. You felt drunk many times. <laughs> and when we had you at Harvardville, and, and by God, Harvard should have had you and Beverly there to celebrate. That hospitality, it was magnificent, and we all told those stories all day long. But I walked out of there, and I got about halfway home, and I said, damn it. The thing we didn't do was to say how important your poetry was to us, and what came from that experience of that poetry. And a couple days later, and you'll forgive the image, but I was standing in the shower. I do a great deal of thinking in the shower. And I was thinking about Bill standing in the shower. And this came into my head. I have a picture of Bill in my shower, but we're not going to Listen to this. Fred Astaire. It's all in the name. Fred. Single, syllable, stopping on a dime carrying the ringing into a stair, a partner with S as S, with T, T, with A, leather heels on marble ascending, a certain ice in the charm. Fred, brief for Frederick, out of Austerlitz, a stair, click. And as a poet, as I was standing in the warm water, I said, you bloody well don't need to know or study anything else than that right there. The fact of the subject, 
the fact of the syllables, everything clicking on every single cylinder. It's a little absolute masterpiece, and these run throughout Bill's work. And they have taught me again and again, I don't write like Bill, but when I'm sitting working on my bilious work, <laughs> there's constantly this voice in my head said, could you use a little less? Could you concentrate? <laughs> Three hours is not necessary. <laughs> Go for that syllable. Go for the click. Right? So to have Bill come in with Garrett tonight is the keel to everything that I want to do here. It's been the keel of Boston poetry for 30 years, and it's a magnificent poetry that Mr. Corbett has given us. William Park. <laughs> Garrett on his 75th. A fawn with bee stung lips steps up to a Needix counter, nickel orange drink, and a pointed paper cup slipped into a plastic holder. Mugs of pale ale at McSorley's, 15 cents. I'm nostalgic for your past, the life I had a crush on growing up in suburban Connecticut, your 50s Isle of Manhattan where from radios and corner candy stores came, there was a boy, a very strange enchanted boy, <laughs> who drank afternoon ales with Tennessee Williams, who drove to Virginia to see and hear a talking horse, who strolled beneath the O's of Times Square camel smoke before breakfasting on wedges of Toffinetti's cakes and cream pies. You were a slip of a girl, destined to become Jean Tierney, a vet in suntans, an adept of Crowley's, a rider for the Pony Express, a sailor on shore leave, quoting Hart Crane, seeing Oscar Brand, a jockey with a sprained, no, that was broken-nosed O'Hara. I went with my parents to a midtown furrier's loft and watched salesmen throw down mink coats on the salesroom floor, where they fanned out like clamshells, and I drank whiskey sours in Maria's Crisis Cafe, underage. You passed through Sheridan Square, intent on a rendezvous. I'd read about and invent smooth out into an embraceable past. It's the crush we want. Lifetime, irrevocable, the looked up to world. You on your feet at Yankee Stadium, cheering blonde Gifford as he catches one in the flat and breaks tackles. You at the Cafe Bohemia, whispery miles and garrulous Coltrane on the stand. Our boot heels <coughs> wandering into the jingle jangle morning. Whoa, that's my life. Merging with yours. <laughs> Your hands and mine, booted feet on the gas. We'll erase the years exactly as memory has and will. Big dinner that night. Nine Club of Square. I like to write occasional poems. There's a good title. It's a game I play with Ed Barrett. I've just scored two in one day. Pints in the fog, jars of Guinness on a fog-bound dingle afternoon, and the boy board, hours ago, Diego William Brody Jones. There's a title. <laughs> Fifty years ago and more, I sat across from Jim Harrison in the Austin apartment he and Linda had, uh, Jim and Linda's furniture was held together by band-aids and friction tape. Uh, I had the great fortune of um, having as a friend when I was a very young man somebody 
that much older, the first real poet I ever knew, uh, who had all respects for authority and none. So it was the best kind of education. Uh, Garrett knew him. Uh, we spent a lot of time together, Jim and I did, in uh, Gloucester. He died and this past year and was on the front page of the New York Times, which would have both gladdened and abused him. I was, uh, it was great to see him in a big obit uh, in the Times. I want to remember him uh, with some poems. This, two of them for the, his first book, Plain Song, Poem. Form is the woods, the beast, a bobcat padding through red sumac, the pheasant in brake or goldenrod that he stalks, both rise to the flush, the brief low flutter and catch in air, and trees, rich green, the moving of boughs and the separate leaf, yield to conclusions they do not care about or watch. The dead frayed bird, the beautiful plumage, the spore of feathers and slight pink bones. Kinship from the same book. Great Uncle Wilhelm, Mennonite, patriarch, eater of blood sausage, leeks, head cheese, salt pork, you are led into church by that wisp you plundered for nine children. Your brain is sugar now. Your white beard is limp. You talk of acres of corn where there is only snow. Your sister, a witch, old as a stump, says you are punished now for the unspeakable sin that barred you from the table for seven years. They fed you cake to hasten your death. Your land is divided. Curse them, but don't die. <laughs> uh, Jim died with a pen in his hand in Patagonia, Arizona, about six lines through a poem. Heart attack. This is from his last book. Uh, there will be a uh, big collected, I'm sure, and there may well be another book following this one beforehand. Galactic. Sitting out in my chair near Linda's garden, a mixture of flowers and vegetables, pink iris, wild poppies, roses, blue salvia and veronica among tomatoes, green beans, eggplant and onion. I think that I sense the far-flung galaxies and hear a tinge of the solar winds. Where is my dead brother? I want to know. With so many infirmities, I await the miraculous. Galaxies are grand thickets of stars in which we may hide forever. When Jim and Linda went to left Cambridge for Michigan, never to return except as visitors, and Linda never to return uh, to Cambridge at all, we had one of the first of the Beverly and Bill parties in the apartment on Harvard Street. And we drank everything from the water out of the taps. I remember <laughs> finding Paul, the uh, Hannigan poet friend, half naked with his girlfriend in the shower. <laughs> uh, and it was just a knockdown, drag out as Harrison deserved. Uh, the next morning, as always, after something we'd done that night, uh, Jim and I talked on the phone, and I said, did your brother get home? And he said, oh, Christ, I don't know. And he said, I ought to go looking for him. And he hung up, and about five minutes later called back and said, I just opened the front door. He's passed out right <laughs> He became the librarian for the state of Arkansas. <laughs> hired by Bill Clinton. <laughs> that was John Harrison. Wife, uh, his wife was a poet, Rebecca Newth. Bridge. Most of my life was spent building a bridge out over the sea, though the sea was too wide. I'm proud of the bridge, hanging in the pure air. Machado came for a visit, and we sat on the end of the bridge, which was his idea. Now that I'm old, the work goes slowly. 
ever near, ever nearer death. I like it out here, high above the sea, bundled up for the arctic storms of late fall, the resounding crash and moan of the sea, the hundred foot depth of the green troughs, troughs. Sometimes the sea roars and howls like the animal it is, a continent wide and alive. What beauty in this, the darkest music, over which you can hear the lightest music of human behavior, the tender connection between men and galaxies. So I sit on the edge, wagging my feet above the abyss. Tonight, the moon will be in my lap. This is my job, to study the universe from my bridge. I have the sky, the sea, the faint green streak of Canadian forest on the far shore. I now hear this is my job to study the universe. Olson's, I'm going to cry, a republic sitting on Watch House Point at the end of the... Uh, I'm getting to the age where, as a younger friend came to dinner the other night and said, Bill, this is, uh, I seem to be in touch with you only when your friends die. Uh, well, we had a lot of friends and there's going to be a lot more of this, but uh, they don't die as long as we're alive. Uh, Bill Berkson, who uh, uh, was a man of great beauty, physical beauty, uh, great generosity, uh, great charm, great knowledge of art, great help uh, to other people. We worked with on a number of things. Pressed Wafer was happy to publish for Bill anything to fetch rip, uh, dedicated to him. Uh, he had both lungs replaced and he lived for 12 more years uh, in the most intense possible way. Our publisher, and I speak of Joe's, and, uh, Michael's, and mine, um, and Jonathan Strong's, and Ed Barrett's, and Angie Malenko's, many of the people who came out of, uh, of word of mouth Roland Pease, published two books of Bill's, and I want to remember him with a few poems. Familiar Music, a pair of dark blue panties among hairbrushes. Ennis Mirabilis. Funny. I'm capable. If the house blew up, I'd probably do the right thing. <laughs> and he was very capable. Gloria. A large U.S. flag flaps loudly outside our dining room, suspended on a pole from the topmost balcony across the way. I keep taking it for some poor thug running through the late September night, seek sneakers smacking. Rendition. The song Willem de Kooning said he wanted played at his funeral. Frank Sinatra's Saturday night is the loneliest night of the week. <laughs> Never happened. What he got instead was selected arias from Verdi's Aida. <laughs> a scratchy rend rendition indeed, as angelic choruses muttered softly among themselves in unison, Aida, fucking Aida. <laughs> responding to any number of impulses as best he could. But he writes a kind of poem that I like, documentary poems. And this is one, and uh, then I'll lead into another. Vibretto came from Lee Wiley, Judy Garland told your correspondent, in 1960, while listening to an old 78 RPM pressing of Lee's Give It Back to the Indians signature song. Bunny Berrigan first recorded I Can't Get Started 
with a small group that included Joe Bushkin, Cozy Cole, and Darty Shaw in 1936. Earlier that same year, the song, written by George Gershwin and Vernon Duke, and rendered as a duet pattern number by Bob Hope and Eve Arden, made its debut on Broadway in the Ziegfeld Follies. By 1937, when Berrigan recorded it in a big band setting, I Can't had become his signature song, even though within a few months Billie Holiday would record her astonishing version, backed by Lester Young and the rest of the Basie Orchestra. Lovers for a time, Wiley and Berrigan began appearing together on Wiley's 15-minute CBS radio spot, Saturday Night Swing Club, in 1936. But in 1939, when Wiley recorded her album of Gershwin songs, both Berrigan and I Can't Get Started were absent from the set. Berrigan died from alcoholism-related causes on June 2, 1942. Although I Can't Get Started is perfectly suited to Wiley's deep phrasing and succinct vibretto, she recorded the ballad only once, informally, in 1944, during a Los Angeles club date. The Spanish Civil War started in 1936 and ended in 1939, with Generalissimo Francisco Franco's forces entering Madrid. I've settled revolutions in Spain goes the line of Duke's lyric. Just as odd. <laughs> uh, among Bill's many accomplishments, he believes, and I can only agree with him until somebody proves him wrong, that he was the only person to attend both Woodstock and Truman Capote's famous black and white ball at the plaza. <laughs> his, he was there as his mother's date. So he actually knew the people in this poem, history at night. It happened in Roddy McDowell's New York apartment. The night he gave, I've got to tell you a story about Roddy McDowell's New York apartment. <laughs> Michael Palmer's uh, father-in-law, the great, uh, uh, he was known as the magician, the great plastic surgeon who operated on the seven Hiroshima women were so badly burned and really saved their uh, their lives, made their lives. Uh, he and uh, Bunny and Beaton, his wife, uh, lived above Rodney McDowell's apartment. And one night, Michael and I were in New York, uh, staying at their apartment, and we got separated. And I got drunk, and uh, I got off at the wrong floor. And the apartment the number looked absolutely the same. <laughs> and of course, I rang the doorbell. And I rang the doorbell because I, my key wouldn't work. And I figured, what the hell had happened? And who opened it but Roddy McDowell? <laughs> and I'm thinking of how green was my valley. <laughs> He's very pissed off. And I said, I must have charmed her because I said, my God, you're Roddy McDowell. <laughs> and he said, I said, he was very sweet and said, you won't upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> it happened in Ronnie McDowell's New York apartment. The night he gave a party for Judy Garland and a few good friends. It was also the night of the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. Central Park West, July 11th, 1960. Respectively, Myrna Loy, fresh from her return to movie Stardom and From the Terrace. Montgomery Cliff recuperating a pace. Adley Stevenson was supposed to be a shoe-in as the Democrats' nominee for President of the United States. Lauren, Betty McCall, an avid Adley fan, had gone off alone to Roddy's bedroom to watch the proceedings on TV. Those sons of bitches, growled Betty, appearing nonplussed in the doorway to the living room. Judy was laughing and confiding, patting Monty's knee. Stephen Sondheim listened and lifted and lowered his chin. Carol Lawrence watched starry-eyed, somewhat awestruck, and Larry Kurt wondered. No one knew much about John F. Kennedy yet. All they could think was Harvard and Boston Irish Catholic. Judy drank Blue Nun, Lieb from Lick, poured from the tall, thin bottle she had bought in a black tote bag. 
Bill was the glue between the uptown scene, the society scene, and between the poets. Uh, the Frank O'Hara generation the, and his own second generation generation. And he did so with great aplomb. Uh, I've gone back to teaching and I've been teaching Lauren Niedecker and she wrote a different kind but very beautiful documentary poems. This was to be in the book she never got printed called New Goose, which was to be New Mother Goose poems. Black Hawk held in reason, land cannot be sold, only things to be carried away, and I am old. Young Lincoln's general move, pawpaw and bloom, and to this day, Black Hawk, reason has small room. Audubon, tried selling my pictures, in jail twice for debt, my companion, a sharp, frosty gale. In England, unpacked them with fear. Must I migrate back to the woods unknown, strange to all but the birds I paint? Dear Lucy, the servants here move quiet as kill deer. <laughs> Here's a poem. And she took that from letters, and she would boil them down in her condensary. Here's a poem that uh, her the very complicated relationship with Louis Zukowski and the many letters she sent him. Zukowski picked this out of a letter. It was something her mother actually said, but she was writing in New Goose, a kind of folk poetry. The Museum Man. I wish he'd taken Pa's spit box. I'm going to take that spit box out and bury it in the ground and put a stone on top because without that stone on top, it would come back. <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> Who was Mary Shelley? What was her name before she married? She eloped with this Shelley. She rode a donkey till the donkey had to be carried. Mary was Frankenstein's creator, his yellow eye, before her husband was to drown. Created the monster nights after Byron, Shelley, talked the candle down. Who was Mary Shelley? She read Greek, Italian. She bore a child who died, and yet another child who died. The way she ends that poem reminds me of, you know, of course, the beautiful ending of And No Birds Sing, La Belle Dame Sans Merci. I too, every once in a while, write documentary poems. This came directly from a news report in the Times, all the details did, and it's one I've never read before. It's called Turkeys. <clears throat> Clayton Berg, the Penner Brothers, Willie Levy, and 30 other Lenny Smalls in an Atalisa, Iowa schoolhouse awake at 3 a.m. six mornings a week for 30 years to hang 20,000 40-pound Tom turkeys a day by their feet who, stunned, slit, and bled out the boys used two fingers to yank down their crops, which earned them $65 a month, and lunch, a PB&J sandwich, cherry coke, and duchess honey bun. The rest of their earnings deducted for room, board, and in-kind services, like one visit a year to an amusement park. Keith Henry of Henry's Turkeys, who did this to them, allowed us how <coughs> they were paying their own way, holding down a job, and weren't depending on the government. <coughs> Income equality has had a long history in this country. Steve Clay of Granary Books, 
uh, put me together with the great painter Rackstraw Downs to make a book called I Rode with the Cossacks. And I rode with the Cossacks through Franz Klein's Lehighton Down Mansion House Hill to where the shallow Lehigh railroad tracks on either side cuts through the narrow valley. And Jim Thorpe climbs left and right up Bear Mountain. I rode with the Cossacks on the queue under Dr. Ziz Moore's banner beside short and sturdy Mexicans, costume jeweled, Russian women, broad-nosed Haitians and bearded Jews. I rode when storefronts advertised, we have Earth Angel, and Jim Thorpe was Mock Chunk, and East Mock Chunk and soft, cold trains rode beside the Lehigh. I rode through Easton, calling out, may you live in the shade of your father's dung, calling out a thousand thousand whale peckers up your mother. Cossack curses, mild Dr. Brown taught us. I rode with the Cossacks, beardless, to New York by bus, reading Hart Crane, oh, harp and altar, years before me. I rode with the alabasters, Russian sunflowers overhead, and rode the Portland Yarmouth Ferry, Sidekick to Pete Wilson, a ghost ship, avoiding the casinos and piano bar. The world is not a narrative, though all worlds are linked. Walker points to a green on name. The words are not a narrative. Little room, little ponies of the Golden Horde, dried meat under their saddles, cleared the steps into the plains where I rode with my our ancestors, braggart knights of the broadsword. After dinner, over cigars and coffee, I strode with the Cossacks one day, mouse steps the next down the infinite corridor of academe. What fearful symmetry, anxiety ridden, trembling before a typo. It's just a draft, just a draft. <laughs> I rode into the setting May sun, name misspelled, with no future. The road that led here leads back, but to no place ever the same. I rode legless in London, a case of Johnny Walker in the hallway, bottle for the milkman and one for the painter who reeled in a welly, then cast again hoping for the other one. I rode with the ductworks, carrying weather, Road water courses, phone wires, electric lines, power grids, and wind turbines all the way to Archer City and its space feds. Larry McMurtry stopped in the street. Road superhighways and turnpikes round the Cloverleaf off ramp and service road and cross the Charles East River and after Manhattan cross the Hudson by barge drift, ditch, and culvert, semi and flatbed, each and every highway, gantries at Bath, at Thomaston, the cement plant, in Rockland, Primo, and follow the Kennebec North to Waterville, where mint stucco museum walls show off suave Alex Katz's night visions, gorgeous as another's razor wire, fences, and wastewater treatment plants, wrap around gallery walls. The Cossacks rode through my dreams, scotch dreams and rum, recurring night, a reading, panic of no book, books, blank pages, empty binder, audience talking over my excuses as if they can't hear, I am not there, and up the slip, splintery stairs, like no school I've known, a semester's missed classes, Students, strangers, mist on bedside windows, won't burn off till morning. Harvard, Seaver Hall, now on Main Street, Bridgeport, across from St. Vincent's Hospital, where I know it is not. No, I miss no classes or September's horizons. Nothing. I rode up to the Church of the Paulist Fathers, Weehawken, by way of Pulaski Skyway, Pork bellies, titanium, winter wheat, the cheese boys, Kinsman's Ridge, Sean Hills, Society in Solitude, number five, and Pete's 
purple carrots, and radio towers where fields meet, behind the scenes right in front of us, and someone asleep at WDEV during the star-filled hours, we listen to a season of Red Sox one-run losses. The rivers of stars without end, Babel rode with the Cossacks, with Bodiani's first cavalry, and so rode Philip Guston, his little bastards, and Nina Simone's Mississippi Goddamn. You don't get much sleep, do you? Babel joked. Simone spat it out. The poor girl on 110th Street and Broadway must have mailed a fake letter 30 or 40 times in every acorn and oak. Signature, but no pattern. Green, nameless leaves on Tolstoy's grave. Charles Wright's way of looking, his Virginia backyard, Montana Skyway, more clouds than Tiepolo, more than Constable. Clouds gathered and gathered in all the tomorrows. There will be no yesterdays. Pyramids along the Nile, photographs and souvenirs, internet or memory. Be true to your vulgarities, Haberman advised. Embrace your contradictions. The knots will not be untied. Civilization is memory, wrote Kenner, and after the Somme, Auschwitz, Hiroshima, Stalin, Mao, and Pol Pot spin the globe. What is memory? Through clear water, leaf shadow, sun, through bright lake water, net of light, beautiful, but to what use? Northeast Kingdom, Hardtop, Blacktop, Town Road, I Road, Vermont, 110 South, Curvy Stretch, Round Hills, Hem In Farms, all the way from Ferguson to New Jerusalem, to Woodstock, Lawrence Rockefeller's town, along the rivers, Hurricane Irene, shook loose boulders to down bridges, condemn this land. The summer of world fires burning, to moor the golfers and the painters, Walp and Scott, blueberries for one in a spare upstairs world, and for the other, paper water, alive by brush and leaf overhang. The pleasure of the road is the yoga master's thoughtless thought, bishops, rich mud in burning rivulets, Maine, black mud, pudding skin, Ilya Repin's shirtless Cossacks wearing top knots, each and every freeway. What's more than this? Split, furrowed, creased, mottled, stung. Merritt, cross country, Sawmill River, Henry Hudson West Side Highway, Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, where no Cossack clattered. Rackstra, tunnels. You came close in 1988 from 75 Varick to the Holland Tunnel entrance, each and every thoroughfare. What's more, from Washington Bridge on the Harlem River, crossing in August, Fort Lee, leaving the beehive yard between Presidio and Rudissa, Texas, I rode with the Cossacks from a lifetime of classrooms, off the stage, the rooms at my command, the rooms I enter in sleep, are not those I knew, all a sigh and slow forgetting. The mist will burn off, and by late morning, the day will begin. teaching, but I'm back, <laughs> where I belong at, um, at NYU. On a Ben theme, I get around Boston, still, up to the erasures, as if I never looked into the mirror and shaved at 9 Columbus Square. I get around newly in Brooklyn, down the blocks, 
where hair is an industry. And I get to my first city, Manhattan. The parents shop for me, letting me free to find a Nigel Molesworth book. The scared thrill of that two-block walk jolts me today as I step arm raised to hear a hum-colored cab. The belt, a gift through years of hoops. We can get again. The belt, a gift through years of loops. I think about you. Rain. The brown duster, another gift, I think about you. The, do, the June day, we left Boston, you left too. Thelonious and Bruno named you Bill Coffee. Siri, Coffee Bill. They think about you. Christmas trees, you'll never see. He, on Parkside. All of us in Brooklyn. Beverly. Marty, Arden, and Andrew riding the queue, never again to call you with their news. alone think of you. This poem has been variously titled. It's called Nine. One of the great gifts we had uh, when we left the house was the simplest. Uh, Michael Russum Uh, took a photo of the number and had it <coughs> incised in a tile. So this is nine. <clears throat> Whoever these birds are, they announce the dawn. The brand new hanging light at nine Columbus Square is still on. I thought to write myself out of that beloved home. Write the dinners, cast of characters, Arden's parties, Marnie's weddings, the morning, <laughs> the morning light from the back living room, our terriers, write the loving and fights, break-ins, cellar rats, smell of strippies, Beverly's mighty labors, the Beverly, Marnie, Arden of that house, the thousands of dents in my consciousness left by it. A few, four or five sentence attempts killed them. Tonight, thought I could not begin to add the sums of that life. We moved on a Friday, and that Monday, Monday to be exact, June 29th, the day Bill Kelly died alone, a crew of Russians smashed to bits the interior of our house, down to staircases and studs. What got carried away? is where the true life lives on. Today I keep my last appointment with the doctor who wrote the scripts for antidepressants and sleeping pills that got me through all this. Then the Acela to Brooklyn. Sunday afternoon reading, just like we're now, 3 o'clock, where we'll have Edward Barrett reading, and Ms. Roz is 
was a long time habitue of word of mouth. Quiet the words in the way. Our videographer. Hi. <laughs> Tomas Pinto Franco. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yes? Yeah. Well, sure. That can be, you should write in the front. Oh. For the library <laughs> the Oh, your donation. Talk amongst yourselves, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs>